Want jy sien alles het begin by die kruis. Everything started at the cross. Then see the first one to get at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. At the cross, at the cross, where I
will be coming back to take us where he prepared a place for us. One of these days we'll be with Jesus. One of these days our spirit will leave us. One of these days I'll be with Jesus. One of these days our spirit will be lost. One of these days.
this sermon today, given a heading, the transformation from a son of God to a Messiah. There is many sons of God. In the book of Job, it's written that Satan went and goes up to the throne of God constantly, and he's quite irritable, and he comes in and accuses the brethren, you and me, before God. On the day when the sons of God were gathered. God has got many sons, although he's only got one begotten son. But when Jesus Christ was, if you want to refer to him, as still young, although you can't really because the word was and is and shall be. The Son of Man, when I refer to the word of God, has been there since the creation of man, since the creation of the world. But when Israel was young and they were captive for over 400 years, the children of Jacob was enslaved in Egypt. And sometimes, if you haven't suffered in life, you cannot relate to something. If you haven't gone through trials in your life, if you've never been crook, if you never had cancer, if you never had lost a child, you can't really relate to the pain of someone. I'm talking about people that's been enslaved for over 400 years. That's a long time. 1652. The Andan Rubia came to the Cape of Good Hope. So am I correct if I say that in the year 2052 be 400 years? Is that right? That's not too far from now. Hopefully we'll make it all. <laughs> The most of us, anyway. The others will be in heaven. Praise the Lord. They'll be praying for us down here. 400 years is such a long time. You can take the, uh, even even Australia, in, in the early 1600s, the Dutch. We were here first, don't let them tell you otherwise. The Dutch sailed around <laughs> Australia, and we just didn't, couldn't find, you know, uh, the place didn't uh, uh, correspond to our palace, so we just you know, kept on going to, the, to South Africa. But we were here first, nevertheless, to say. And um, 400 years, if you think about what happened in Australia, how it was built up from nothing to something, and even the South African side of things, it was, there was no castle, no houses, no homes in South Africa when we got there in 1652. We built the first castle, of course, with thick walls and cannons and all, all the violence that went along with it. But still, for 400 years, I'm trying to let you get a, a grasp of time. For 400 years, longer than that, the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt. And, of course, they, they, they were, they were uh, fruitful, and, and uh, there was a lot of them. And it is said that they helped build some of the pyramids. They had to make bricks, the Bible says. And then... Pharaoh would, would be very difficult sometimes and not give them the appropriate tools and the appropriate wood they needed to bake the, the bricks and, and all that. And the harsh, harsh slave labor that rested upon them made an imprint in their lives. And I want to talk to you this morning a little bit about that. And all through this, there was a son of God, a sort of a pre-incarnated Jesus Christ witnessing this and slowly but steadily transformation happened in his own life. The Bible also says that Christ through his suffering had to learn obedience. That's something. The transformation from a son of God to a Messiah. Exodus 12 then from verse 29. I'm going to skip through Exodus 12, 13 and 14, only the very important verses. And it came to pass that at midnight, so it was dark. Midnight, but yet it was full moon, so it wasn't that dark. I don't know if you've noticed uh, the full moon in the last few days, a couple of days ago. 
about that time. That at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborns in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh, which in fact is recorded in the hieroglyphs in Egypt, the firstborn of Pharaoh that was slain, slain by an angel. It's recorded. The Bible is as true as the day a whole day. Archaeology proves a lot, a lot, a lot of the Bible. The firstborn of Pharaoh was sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborns of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt. Just imagine, I woke up last night, me, and, and I heard Paul was snoring, in fact. How old are you, mate? Twelve. You know, you realize that you snore. <laughs> you were lying on your back, just getting into it. You should turn on your side. But I went to have a look at what noise is that? First, I, I thought it was the possums running on the roof. A quite busy night. And I got to his room, and even William, our little silky Terry, decided to leave his room because I don't blame him, it's just too much noise going. <laughs> but just imagine you show up and your firstborn. Is dead. Let that sink in for a second or two. The whole of Egypt was crying out for, because even Pharaoh's son didn't make it. The deaf angel went through, and all the houses where the blood of a lamb, <coughs> the sacrificial lamb, was not on the doorpost nor the side post. The deaf angel went in. In history, and Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. In every house of the Egyptians, one dead. He rose up in the middle of the night, and he called for Moses and Aaron by night, and said, Rise up, and get you forth from among my people. He chased them out. Both you and the children of Israel, and go, serve the Lord as you have asked. <coughs> also take your flocks, your herds, as you have said, and be gone, and be gone, and bless me also. And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them off out of the land in haste, for they said, We be all dead men. And the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading, Trows being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. And then Exodus 13, verse 8. Let's keep that one. Exodus 14, from 1 to 10. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before, bear with me, Pihahirot, between Michdol and the sea, over against baal Zeven, before it shall you encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. When Pharaoh commanded, he chased the Israelites out. They had several routes which they could take. And there was a wilderness to the northeast of Egypt. And this is the wilderness that is spoken about right here. Pharaoh will say, verse 3, of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them. And I will be honoured upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people have fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. I got a lovely picture, I've got to show you, don't laugh, it looks something like that. <laughs> and he made ready his chariot, the Pharaoh himself. Do you see the pain and anguish on his face? Mm. Why is there pain? 
Stephen? Was his firstborn just died? Because his firstborn son was dead. Was there revenge? Was there revenge? No. Oh, yes. And he, Pharaoh, made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. Josephus records that Pharaoh had 50,000 horsemen chasing after the Israelites. 50,000. And 200,000 footmen as well as all the chariots as well. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses, the chariots of Pharaoh, and his horsemen, and his army. And they overtook them in camping by the sea beside Pihiroth, before Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord their God. For many years the crossing, the crossing spot of the Israelites were unknown. I forgot the guy's name, but you can watch YouTube. It's in fact an Australian archaeologist who discovered the Red Sea crossing. He lived in Adelaide. He went down many years after this happened, and he just took the Bible, and he took these names, and he noted that while the Israelites were exiting, that's what ex exodus means, Exodus, they were exiting Egypt. Suddenly, God stopped Moses and said, take a right turn into the wilderness. The Bible states. And Moses took a right into the wilderness. And I want to show you how it looked. It looked like that. That's the place. Note here in the middle that there's only one way in and one way out. Coming from the top from Egypt, these cliffs are staggering. Yet uninhabitable, uncrossable. But in the valley between these mountain ranges, the Israelites came through, heading to a beach, to the shores of the Red Sea, 5,000 foot deep water. That's how deep it is. The Red Sea is one of the prime, if not the most, sought after diving spots in the world. It's beautiful. And all the Israelites, to account, they think about two million of them, because they only mention in the Bible the amount of men, but they don't mention the amount of women and the children. They came through those cliffs and ended up on the beach in the Gulf of Aqaba. A beach large enough to easily accommodate two million people. God knew where this place was. And you can imagine the children of Israel carving through these mountains and ending up on a beach and there's a sea in front of them. They would have felt entrapped. They would have felt frightened. They would have felt betrayed. And Pharaoh was gaining on. Archaeology, archaeology is, is stunning on the way to, this, to the Red Sea. The Egyptians built, you've got to remember that they were the empire of that time. You know what the Egyptians built. You've seen the pyramids. You've seen them all. The Egyptians built it and they had a very well all, uh, managed war system. They built the towers. Look out the towers. They was manned by Egyptian soldiers 24-7. And they had mirrors. Mirrors on these towers. Mirrors made out of steel, polished steel. And they would signal back into every corner of the empires to each other with Morse code. 
So how they knew that the Israelites took a right into the desert is because not far from this crossing spot, there's two towers, ancient Egyptian towers, where the mirrors was situated upon. It's interesting, isn't it? They signaled Pharaoh, look, look, they came this way. And you would like to think that behind the deaf angel, behind the hatred of Pharaoh, was Satan himself. As you sit here this morning, you were created to the image. Every man in this congregation, can you please raise your hand? You were created to the image of God. It means that there's something godly inside of every one of us. We are so keen to forget that. And that's why Satan hates man so much. That if he could have his way, he would kill us all. And he was trying because he infiltrated Pharaoh's heart. Past the point of sorrow. That he lost his firstborn son. And he pumped him up with hatred and revenge. And went after the children of God. The promised children. The children of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. These were all in theory. Jacob's sons and daughters, nearly two million of them, encamped on the beach with no way in and no way out. The only way in, Pharaoh was coming. But they also saw something quite spectacular that day. There was a cloud. A column, the Bible talks about. And this column ended up staying there for 40 years. A cloud column during the day. It guided the Israelites for 40 years. And suddenly this day, when they were being chased by the Egyptians, and they ended up on this beach, they saw this very vertical kind of looking column, cloud, like, a bit like Kimiyu Nimbus cloud. And at night time, this cloud would turn to a cloud of fire. And the Bible said, the Israelites camped, yet it wasn't dark, because the cloud provided them with light. Isn't that something? And this cloud was in front of the Israelites all the time, as they <coughs> came through and carved through the wilderness when they came to the beach. And when the, when the people started murmuring, when they started to attack Moses verbally, and said, what have you done? You brought us out of Egypt, now we've got nowhere to go. Now we're all going to die. And I believe Moses would have been pretty stressed himself. But the cloud that was in front of the children of Israel left its post. And it went to stand... Right there. Boom. And just by nightfall, just by nightfall, the cloud was that thick that the Bible says that the Egyptians couldn't see, they, they couldn't see their way through. And when sun, the sun went down, the cloud turned to fire. And for a whole night, it separated Egyptians on the other side, right there. <coughs> so close. And God's people here. Who do you think that cloud was? The Bible says the angel of the covenant, Jesus Christ himself, when he was yet the son of God, he wasn't the Messiah yet. And he turned around. This is beautiful to me. And he saw that Pharaoh, charged by Satan and all his demons, were after the children of God with hatred and murder in their heart. There's somebody after your soul today. There's somebody after you. But he saw, Jesus Christ knew they were coming. And he left his position.
and he interceded for us in between the enemy and ourselves. He took his position right in the middle as a barrier. It could have been Gabriel. It could have been God's messenger. Gabriel. It could have been any of the other angels, but no, none of them did it. But Jesus. To me it says something about someone being transformed in his heart to take responsibility and ownership and to give protection to God's people. And I bet that heaven was amazed that the angel of the covenant, Jesus himself, would leave the front of the back and go and stand between the enemy and you. For the whole night, he stood there, the cloud raging with fire, not allowing one Egyptian to get through. Well, the Lord God, Jesus, looked down. He saw the Egyptians frustrated, planning their attack. They knew just on the other side were the Israelites trapped. And suddenly the wind began to blow. Bible says an easterly wind from the mouth of God became to blow. <laughs> it's something. Did Jesus just turn his back while he was standing in the fire column? He started to blow. Now that sea looks like that. If you take time and all the rain that washed through the mountains and brings down all the dust and dirt, you get what we call in Dutch alluvial flutter, a flood plain. You can actually see the flood marks, and it would push the sand, and it just this just becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. But in fact, what happened there? It washed in sand into the ocean. Now, on the other side, on the Arabian side, is exactly the same. By coincidence, you might say, or you, or, you, or you can just say God knows his backyard. On the Saudi Arabia side, the mountains are exactly the same, except for a gully where, through time, the sand filled up, causing an underwater breach. Still, 300 foot of water at its shallowest point. But on the side, 5,000 foot. God knew it was there. And in the Hebrew text, text, the Bible says that the water, it uses the word C-U-E-L, kill, which means in Hebrew, frost. God froze the water, the walls. He parted the ocean with a very strong wind. A hurricane-like wind he parted the ocean on top of the bridge and he froze the walls. That's the Hebrew text. Isn't that something? And then they went through two million people. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a coordinator for two million people. Oh my Lord. Say there were five five hundred thousand babies crying. People whinging, moaning, complaining. The wind's too strong. What's happening? Why is the wind blowing that much? Hey, just imagine Moses standing there. And he lifted his staff. Because God said, lift your staff, Moses. Two, two million people are whining in your ears, but just lift your staff. You might feel this morning that sometimes your family doesn't appreciate you for what you are. Child or parent alike. Sometimes you just need to lift your hands, go into a quiet place and just talk to the Lord. And he did exactly that. He lifted his staff in front of an ocean, impenetrable. But he saw something behind him, a pillar that supported him. Jesus has got your back. I'm 43 years old now, he's always had my back. 
I don't serve God because of religion or the testimony of others. I serve God because of my own faith. So many times uh, I nearly lost my life and the Lord was there to save my life. I've said, they said this uh, a thousand times, I'm going to say it again. When me and my wife were barren, the Lord gave us children. He's my testament. He's got my back. He's got your back. And the ocean started to tremble as the wind started to blow and the waves were raging. And he physically froze a path through the Red Sea. Now you might think it was smooth, it's not. They had to climb down over the rocks. The, the Red Sea is full of uh, rocky uh, shore of sea surface. It's staggering how beautiful it is. They had to climb down over obstacles. It wasn't an easy pathway through. Two million people made their way through the night. And they walked through. And when the last ones were nearly there, Mom, please play for us. It was time for, for Christ to lead the way again. And from the back he removed himself, the column of fire lifted up. And as soon as he lifted, infiltrated, although they saw the miracle, although they saw the warning sign, they saw the column of fire. They just lost their firstborns. They saw the warning, but yet they proceeded. Because Satan has got no regard for the life of men. He will take you to suicide. He will take you to such a point in your life that you feel worthless, unrespected, unneeded. He wants you to become depressed in such a way that your life feels worthless. I'm standing here today. In the name of Jesus Christ, I'm telling you it's not true. The Son of Man died for you on the cross. He stood at the back between the Egyptians and the Israelites. Then he removed himself and he lifted up the cloud of fire. Lifted up and Egyptians came rushing from straight into the ocean. And just as the last ones of the Israelites left the ocean, from the back after the Egyptians, the, the sea started filling up, the ice melted. A miracle. You know that when this Australian stood on these shores, there was no there was no buildings there at the time. It was nineteen seventy one if I remember right. There was no building, there was no development. This Australian stood there in shorts and just a singlet. And with very primitive dive equipment, he started diving. First he uncovered the column the column of Solomon. Massive column, three and a half meters high. Right. On either side of the oceans, one in Saudi Arabia and one on the south. Ancient column under the sand, fallen over. And the inscrip in inscription in engraved around the column tells the whole story. And Solomon wrote this is in honor of Yahweh to commemorate the crossing spot of the Red Sea. The Saudi Arabian government after the, after the exposure of, of this Australian man they went on their side they dug, they found the column in, under the sand took it away put it in the museum this Australian dived further and he found golden wagon wheels all the pharaohs and his priests uh, wagon wheels were gold plated. They found hundreds of horse hooves because of the immense, immense pressure of 
5,000 foot of water on the sides when many of, of those treasures will never be found, it's way too deep. The immense pressure on the horse hooves, which is made of gelatine. Gelatine, I think, same as your finger, the carrot in your Shrunk. Little horse hooves like that, but because of the pressure of the water. And there's people that say the Bible is not true. And the transformation, the transformation from a son of God to a Messiah started building up. The thing about Christ is, is that He confronted Satan every time when He wanted to attack you. Every time that Satan wants to take your life, he has to confront Jesus. He's the mediator. He's the salvation maker. From slaves, they were. Look at all those people standing in front of Moses. From slaves to king's men. Persecuted but empowered today by the blood of the Lamb. Guilty by sin, but set free by Him. All through the desert for 40 years, the column never left. You can see it there in the front. Always guiding the Israelites. And many years after this, When the question was asked in heaven, who will go down and do something about the fact that God's children keep dying without someone that can pay the debt of their sins. Jesus came forth once again. He left his position once again. His safe position once again. And like the cloud of fire between him and the, the Egyptians and the Israelites, he stood once more. He said, I will go fire. And heaven was silent. No. Not you, the son, you only got the son of the living God, the firstborn son. No. Yes, me. I shall go. I shall become like a man. I shall walk in the footsteps of a man. So I can relate to all the pain and suffering that you are going through today. That families in 2021 will be going through. Father, and I want to die on the cross. So all the sin of mankind can be put on my shoulders. So I can physically buy you free, relieve you from judgment and punishment. For you that live a godly life and confess your sins to Jesus Christ, there is hope, there is salvation. Lord, I need you more than I need the sun.
hungry.